Good evening, everyone. Allison Skaberg here. We are happy to be here tonight with Lindsay Asawa. Some of you may have had the pleasure of hearing her speak in the past. It's been a while um, since uh, we have had her as a speaker for ADA. Um, ADA is a, the Attention Deficit Disorder Association, the Southern Region. Um, our um, our group is based out of Sugarland, and we, you know, prior to COVID, we used to meet face to face, and we've been meeting by Zoom ever since. And it seems to be a better platform for a lot of families uh, to begin with. But each month, um, we have a different speaker that um, talks on a variety of topics. It could be medicine. It could be tonight. We're going to be talking about sleep and um, sleep issues. Um, uh, with our population, we, we we talk about parenting. There's so many different topics, and we have different specialist speakers that um, attend every month. Um, so tonight, um, from a housekeeping perspective, we're going to do things. If you guys have attended in the past, we're going to do things a little bit differently tonight. Um, everybody, first of all, is in webinar mode, which means that we can't see you or hear you. So you can do a little cheer for that. Um, but we do know you're there. And um, what we would like you to do is we invite you to put your questions in the chat box as we're going along. But tonight, what we're going to do, instead of taking the questions like throughout the presentation, we're going to do the questions at the end. So that way we can make sure that Lindsay can um, get through her content. Um, her content this evening. Tonight's webinar is being recorded and everyone will get a copy of the slides so you don't have to take notes on every single thing uh, that you see. You will actually get an email with a copy of the slides. And um, also in that email, you'll have an invitation to join ADA. Um, Pam Esser was the founder of this organization and it was, you know, um, founded to, to put out information um, and help for families and individuals who have ADD, ADHD, um, to, to be a, a, a source and, 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 and a resource. And it was never Pam's um, plan that people absolutely, in order to get the help that they needed, had to join. Um, but what I would like to say, and, you know, Lindsay doesn't work for ADA, I don't work for ADA, you know, volunteers here, um, is it costs about $40 a year to join uh, this organization. And it, this organization is doing big and great things. Um, they have uh, an annual conference and they have speakers that come in from all across the country that are really, really wonderful. So you guys can look at that application. We'll send that um, in the link, but families can join for just $40 a year. Um, there are um, groups all across the state of Texas. Uh, there are groups for adults um, and there are parent groups. Uh, this happens to be um, more of a focus of a parent group um, <clears throat> for loved ones uh, that have ADHD or ADD. So um, just to give you a little bit of insight on that, so you guys can um, look for your email probably tomorrow with the link to the slides and um, uh, a, a copy of the slides and a link to the recording. Um, having said that, um, we are excited to have Lindsay Asawa with um, Missouri City Family Counseling uh, with us tonight. And um, Lindsay, I would just love to turn it over to you. Thank you, Allison. Okay. So um, my name's Lindsay Asawa. I'm a licensed psychologist. As Allison said, I am uh, with Missouri City Family Counseling. I'm a co-owner of our practice and I've been doing testing and therapy for years and working with kids, adolescents and adults with ADHD. This has kind of become my area of interest area of expertise in some ways, just because it's something I'm really interested in and have seen so many clients over the years who struggle with ADHD. And, um, and then in my own personal life, I have three kids, all of which seem to have ADHD brains as luck would have it as well as my husband. And so I think, and my sister, so, you know, I'm, I'm surrounded by wonderful, beautiful ADHD brains and love them all very much. And I've learned so much about this diagnosis over the years. So I just really like sharing the information that I've learned with all of you. And today I wanna to talk about sleep because this is a big issue that comes up all the time in our therapy sessions and the testing that I do. Um, it's just a huge issue for 
ADHD brains. And I, you'll notice I use that term a lot, ADHD brains, because we're always talking about um, the brain and how it relates to this diagnosis. And um, so you'll hear me saying that a lot, but th this is a big issue. Um, there's two things I'm going to divide this up and talk first about some of the struggles, the sleep struggles, specifically for people with ADHD brains. And then I'm going to talk about some strategies that I have learned over the years, also that we have learned through research. And then I've used a lot of them with my kids. And so I'll talk to you guys about some of those strategies that can work and be helpful. So here's just kind of some data on ADHD and sleep. And because it is a unique issue with the ADHD population, it, about 25 to 50% of people with ADHD do experience sleep problems. And this seems to worsen with age. So it really becomes an issue for many people kind of around age 12, 13, and then beyond. And so up to 80% of adults are actually reporting ADHD uh, sleep problems. And I think that's that means that it's something that we really need to take seriously and we need to uh, make sure that we're addressing. And we also know, on, kind of on the flip side, if we see some early sleep problems in the, in the younger years, that might be a risk factor for later diagnosis of ADHD. And that could be for two reasons. It could be either because those sleep issues when kids are younger are contributing to some attention problems that might look like ADHD and may or may not be. Um, or it might be that we're seeing some early signs of ADHD behaviors that are impacting their sleep. And later we may determine that they do have an ADHD brain and that's partly what was going on. Um, we also know from the research that there's a couple of different sleep disorders that are uh, much more prevalent in the ADHD population. So snoring and sleep obstructive sleep apnea are um, found in up to a third of people with ADHD diagnosis and restless leg syndrome in about half. So that's, these are things that are quite common in the ADHD population. I hear about them all the time in my evaluations that I do. Um, and people often don't realize that that might be something that's connected with ADHD. Um, some of the sleep issues we hear about and we see in the research are some difficulty falling asleep as well as staying asleep. So lots of night wakings, um, poor sleep quality because there's a lot of restlessness and then insomnia, of course, and then intrusive sleep is related to sleep that happens um, unintentionally and during the day. So when people fall asleep at work or fall asleep while driving um, or at school, um, and that's a big issue for people with ADHD as well. And a tricky thing is that there is a relationship with the stimulant medications, but it's not directly, it's, it's not entirely related to that. So stimulant meds can both hurt or help sleep, either one. So for some people, they can be calming and, and putting someone on a stimulant medication may actually improve their sleep. And then for others, it may disrupt sleep um, because it may keep their brain stimulated later into the evening. So we'll talk about that. But we know that with or without the medication, there's still an issue with sleep in the ADHD population. Um, and so if we just look at the symptoms of ADHD, there's kind of a direct relationship between some of the symptoms and sleep. And because in some of this is just logical. If you think about these behaviors, um, you can imagine how these things would impact sleep. And I'm sure many of you parents have seen this in your kids, but Racing thoughts is a big issue. I hear about this just constantly from clients that they have trouble turning their brain off at night um, and that makes it difficult to fall asleep. People with ADHD have a tendency to hyper-focus, which can interfere with sleep. So if you are very focused on something you enjoy, you know, a book that you really enjoy or a project that you're really into, um, it's really hard to take your attention away from that and follow a, a rigid sleep schedule. So hyper-focus can get in the way. Um, nighttime energy, just feeling, still feeling energetic and restless and overstimulated at night um, can interfere with sleep as well. And that's a common issue with ADHD. Distraction gets in the way for many of the clients I've worked with. So they may have good intentions and um, may, you know, have a sleep, uh, have a bedtime routine in mind, but it's hard to stick with that when there's distractions that come up along the way. And this happens with both kids and adults. Um, 
Poor impulse control is again, an issue with kids and adults with ADHD, and it can interfere with sleep because um, again, if you're starting that sleep routine and then um, something comes up, a thought comes to mind, something you forgot to do, uh, or for a child, you know, a, a toy that they want to go check out real quick or something that they left in their backpack, you know, that very easily they're going to they're going to act on that thought and very easily get off track from that sleep routine. Um, a lot of kids at, with ADHD tend to be very, very sensitive to attention and um, because attention is very stimulating, it feels very, um, very good. And so they tend to be a, a more attention seeking and that can happen at night as well. And I'm sure, again, many of you guys have experienced this with when you're putting your kids to bed and they have to come out to tell you something else, or, um, they sneak out of the room and they wait to see your reaction. And, you know, a lot of attention seeking behaviors at night, and that's partly related to the poor impulse control as well. And so those things can interfere with getting to bed, um, low motivation. I'll talk about this later how to address this, but this is a big issue with a lot of the clients I work with because they'll tell me, you know, that going to sleep is just, it's boring, you know, it's not fun. And it's for people with ADHD brains, being bored is, is physically uncomfortable. It's, um, it's really hard to cope with. And so laying in the, there's nothing more boring than just laying in your bed doing nothing. So it's, it's really hard to feel motivated to get in the bed and go to sleep when there's so many more stimulating, exciting things that you could be doing. So that's a really big issue, um, all the way into adulthood. And then time blindness, you guys may have heard this term before, but for individuals with ADHD brains, um, there's an issue with the awareness of time passing. And so it's either now or not now, but it's kind of hard to under, or hard to be aware of, you know, how much time has passed, um, how quickly it's passed. So someone may say, I'm going to go run real quick to, um, check one last email that I forgot to respond to. And then before you know it, an hour has gone by um, and you've been on the phone and lost track of that time, that time is gone. And so that time blindness also can interfere with that bedtime routine and getting to bed on time. Um, so you can see all of these typical ADHD symptoms very much can impact sleep, getting to bed and, and then being able to fall asleep once you're in bed. Um, and then if we look at all these things, it's not just the, the symptoms and the behaviors caused by ADHD that can impact sleep. What we've found with years and decades of research is that there's actually differences in the ADHD brain that can explain why sleep is an issue. Um, so I have some of these listed on this slide. So First, I have to start with an important point, which you um, I've done presentations just on this alone, because this is a big, important point with ADHD is that it's related to a lack of stimulation in this front part of the brain, that area that's highlighted in the picture, um, the prefrontal cortex. And that's the area of the brain that controls executive functions, which are all the functions that we see impacted with ADHD. All those, a lot of those symptoms we talked about are related to those executive functions. And there's a lack of stimulation in that part of the brain that contributes to ADHD. And um, the reason that's important is because when they've done research on the parts of the brain that are impacted by sleep deprivation, what they found is that it, it tends to have the greatest impact on that part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. So not only is that part of the brain already understimulated in an ADHD brain, but then sleep deprivation impacts that area of the brain even further. So it can really exacerbate those symptoms of ADHD. Um, and in someone who has a non-ADHD brain, sleep deprivation, because it impacts that part of the brain, can bring about symptoms and behaviors that look like ADHD. Um, so another issue that we've seen in the research, this relates to that low stimulation, is there's also a lower dopamine level in that area of the brain in people with ADHD. And the problem there is that dopamine has been something that's very important when it comes to regulating sleep. So if there's a, if there's a deficit of, 
of dopamine in that part of the brain, then it's already going to impact the regulation of sleep and awake, awake and awareness, as well as falling asleep and feeling tired. And then another issue, so these are all things that the research has shown, um, some explanations. Another issue that they found with the research is that there, for people with ADHD brains, there appears to be a delay in the circadian rhythm, which is that internal clock that kind of tells us uh, when to be awake and when to start uh, getting tired and falling asleep. And it also relates to our body um, producing melatonin. And so we need to produce melatonin in order to get, feel tired and go to sleep. And all of that is delayed in people with ADHD brains. So they may tend to get tired a little bit later um, and feel tired a little bit longer, maybe in the mornings, but there's just this shift in that, in that circadian rhythm that also seems to be a problem. Um, another issue is iron deficiency, which is, doesn't impact everybody, but it's actually, um, more common in individuals with ADHD brains. And so blood work has shown lower serum ferritin levels, which relates to iron. And, um, when there's iron deficiency, it can, impact sleep. So all of these different neurological and chemical issues that are going on in the ADHD brain can all um, prevent someone from feeling tired, prevent them from falling asleep, make it more difficult to stay asleep, um, make it more difficult to get good quality restful sleep. So we can see why this is a problem with people who have ADHD brains. And then if we look at what this does to us, you know, when we are sleep deprived, we don't get enough sleep. There's lots of research on the impact of that. And this is just a list. I mean, there's so many other things that I could have listed. This is um, kind of a summary of the research and what it shows that sleep deprivation does to us, both kids and adults. It does increase ADHD symptoms. Um, I've been telling clients for years that sleep is important for everyone, but it's extra important for people with ADHD brains because um, it's going to actually exacerbate those ADHD symptoms, lack of sleep. Well, mental fatigue, you know, feeling tired throughout the day. We know that depression and anxiety symptoms are linked to sleep deprivation and can increase with sleep deprivation. We also know that there's a link with health issues. So there's a higher risk of um, developing high blood pressure, having um, increased problems with allergies and your immune system. These things have all been shown through the research to be directly related to sleep deprivation. Um, of course, you guys have seen with, ki with your kids, irritability and restlessness uh, become more likely when a child's being deprived of sleep and adults. Uh, we experience those things as well. Behavior problems, of course, at home and at school. We also see more school avoidance and kids refusing to go to school or not wanting to go to school because they're feeling so tired in the mornings. Uh, when we do cognitive testing, which I do all the time, this is what I do regularly. And we definitely see an impact of sleep on cognitive performance, on the scores for IQ testing and other types of cognitive testing. Um, so... I always tell families when, when we're doing testing, they we do testing only in the mornings when they're most alert. And we also tell them they need to make sure they get a good night's sleep. If they don't get enough sleep, sometimes I'll cancel it because it's just going to impact their cognitive scores that much. Um, and of course, because of that, we also see lower school performance when there's sleep deprivation involved. Um, and then resiliency, being able to bounce back, being able to cope with challenges, uh, is more challenging whenever you are sleep deprived and injuries because of clumsiness, lack of awareness, tiredness, fatigue. Um, so all of these things are pretty serious issues that are directly related to sleep deprivation. And we know that people with ADHD are more likely to be sleep deprived. So this is, this is something that we really need to take seriously and we need to address. And we need to prioritize it. You know, it's kind of sleep is one of those um, questions that's kind of a side question, you know, on whenever you're seeing your doctor or when you're coming in to see a psychologist like me, it's not usually the focus. 
Um, but I have learned over the years in working with my clients with ADHD that this needs to be more of a focus. And we actually will kind of pick apart how the sleep is going uh, because it has such a big impact. So the next question is how much sleep should your kids be getting? Should you be getting as adults? And this is what the research tells us for each of these age groups. There's kind of a range, but I would encourage you when we're thinking about ADHD to look at the upper end of this range, because like I said earlier, it's really, really, it's extra important if you have an ADHD brain to be getting enough sleep. Um, and so for preschool kids, three to five years old, it's 10 to 13 hours, and that's not including naps. And most kids do stop napping around age five on average, sometimes before or sometimes after, but um, they do need quite a bit of sleep. Elementary age kids still need anywhere from nine to 12 hours. And I would say kids with ADHD, again, it's on the upper end of that. Um, and a lot of parents kind of mistakenly assume that they that our kids at that age need about the same amount that we need. So a lot of parents will tell me, oh, they're getting a good eight hours of sleep. Um, and then I have to let them know that that's actually not enough. That, that does mean that they're sleep deprived at that age. For adolescents, this is a huge problem because you can see this is this might be unexpected, but really the research tells us that adolescents need nine to 10 hours of sleep a night and they are definitely not getting it. Um, and when we look at the, the reality, they're getting on average maybe seven hours a night or less. And so um, across the board, teens are sleep deprived. And it's gotten to a point where a lot of major organizations, health organizations are actually declaring it a health crisis for teens because like I showed you on this other screen, this is what sleep deprivation does to us and to our teens and they are all sleep deprived. So, um, and at, when they are at that age and I have a teenager as well. And so I know how challenging it is to get enough sleep because they're busy with school, uh, with activities. It really is tough and homework. But I think that we can, we tend to kind of let it drop off or teens feel like they don't need enough, any more sleep than what they're getting. They feel like they can run on less sleep, but the reality is that that's not true. They actually really do need it. And we need to make sure that they're prior, prioritizing it and we're prioritizing it. Adults also may sometimes kind of, um, get on the lower end of what they should be getting because what the research is showing that adults really need a minimum of seven hours. And that's because if it, if it's any less than that, it starts to contribute pretty significantly to some of those health issues that I was talking about. So if you want to avoid those health issues, you really have to be aiming for at least seven hours a night or more. Um, so this is easier said than done. I can, I do realize that. And I know it's always a challenge to get this much sleep or help your kids get this much sleep, but I want you to know what to be aiming for. And so even with my kids, my goal is I keep these numbers in the back of my mind because that's what I'm aiming for. And it, it may not always be perfect, but at least I know what the goal is. Um, so that's a lot about what the problem is and why this is a problem, where this problem is coming from. And knowing that, then we can come up with some strategies that can help to address some of those problems that I was mentioning. And I would say that I have practiced these own strategies, these, these exact strategies since my kids were born. Um, and so I've lived this, I've been through it. I've done it with clients for many, many years and helped them through their sleep struggles and these strategies do work, but it's not a quick fix. And there's no one thing that might fix the problem. I would suggest taking all of these strategies and kind of trying things, picking and choosing. And what you have to do is kind of find the magic formula for your child or for you uh, that works best. And it might be different for each. And so like for my kids, I've found a different magic formula for each one of them. I know what conditions we need to have and what strategies we need to use for each of them to make sure they're getting good sleep. So starting with the circadian rhythm issue that I was talking about. So just a kind of a definition of circadian rhythm. It's those, the natural processes in our body and in our brain that follow that internal clock that repeats every 24 hours. 
And those processes are impacted by our, expo our exposure to light and dark. And so um, that's one of those things that we need to pay attention to in order to fix that problem. Um, it's also our circadian rhythm is what regulates our alertness during the day and our sleepiness at night. And so um, some things we need to think about because we know that our kids with ADHD are off track with their circadian rhythm and there's a delay there, we can work on getting them back on track and shifting that delay a little bit. Or we can at least try to make sure that we're not um, contributing to that problem even further and worsening the problem. So some things to really think about and make sure that you're doing with your kids or with yourself is making sure to get morning sunlight and um, you know, make sure that when you go in their bedroom in the morning, open up the window, open up the blinds, um, make sure that they are, if possible, spending a little bit of time outside in the sunlight, ideally either not just in the morning, but during the daytime in general, they need to be getting that sunlight, um, in order for their brain to, um, to get that, the message that it's daytime, this is time to be awake. Um, so that the body knows when to start to produce that melatonin and get ready for sleep. Uh, naps can be a big problem with this because they can really interfere with that circadian rhythm, especially teens tend to do a lot of napping. And I've seen that that's one of the things that can really interfere and kind of make the problem worse um, because they're already getting tired later in the evening. They take a nap after school and then it pushes everything back even further. So if as much as you can avoid naps or have your kids avoid naps, that, that can be helpful. Um, some people have found that just having a walk either in the morning when you first wake up, um, but also at sunset time can be a helpful thing because again, it's it's giving your brain those signals that, that it needs in order to, to shift that circadian rhythm a little bit. Um, at night when kids are sleeping, they need to have a dark bedroom. Some kids, you know, because of nighttime fears, they may want to keep all the lights on, um, but it needs to be dark. Uh, we can use blackout curtains to make sure there's no light coming in from outside or waking them up early in the morning, earlier than they should be. Um, and so I usually tell them, I usually suggest just really, um, minor amounts of light, if possible, just a, a night light, um, something smaller if they're reading at night, just using a reading light if they're reading before bed, but really try to avoid the bright lights at night. Um, and some people actually need and benefit from what they call light therapy or phototherapy, which is basically sitting in the morning when you first wake up, sitting in front of this special light box that has a specific amount of light that it's emitting and you sit in front of it for 30 minutes and then you move on with your day. And it's actually been really effective in the research at shifting that circadian rhythm for people who are off track with those sleep cycles. And it's also really effective actually at treating depression. So um, it can be a really beneficial strategy and it's something you can even order on your own and sometimes can be covered by insurance. So um, that's something that is an option that's out there uh, that you can talk to a doctor about and look into. There's also sunset lamps and wake up light alarm clocks. I've had clients that have used these successfully. And these are lamps that actually will kind of mimic the sunset or the sunrise and, um, and they'll do it at the proper times. And so the light in the room increases uh, gradually. And then at night, the light goes, uh, decreases gradually. And so it does actually seem to work well for a lot of people who are struggling with that circadian rhythm. So this is another really big um, concept that I think is super important for anybody to understand when there's any issues with sleep going on. Um, and just getting your kids set up to be good sleepers. This is really important to know. And I have been using this concept since my kids were babies and it works. Um, so basically sleep associations are conditions that someone needs in order to fall asleep. And this could be objects, it could be noises, it could be certain activities, certain people, but whatever is going on, whatever conditions are present um, that when you fall asleep, then what's happening is your brain is associating sleep with those conditions. 
So our brain is really good at kind of linking those linking things and making those associations. And because our brain does that, we have to be very aware of that. And so we may sometimes unintentionally create some unhealth, unhealthy or unhelpful sleep associations. And that might be contributing to the problem. And oftentimes when I'm working with clients who are struggling with sleep, that's what I'm finding is that there's some issues with some sleep associations that we need to break. Um, so the goal is to break some of those unhelpful ones and actually set up and create some healthy sleep associations. And you can do this from day one, from the very beginning with your kids, or you can do it at any point along the way uh, when you figure out that there's some unhealthy sleep associations going on. You can always change this, um, but it does take time to change it. And it takes lots of consistency. That's the most important thing because in order for our brain to form those associations, we have to do the same thing every single time repetitively, every single night. And then it's our brain starts to form some new associations. Um, one of those, oh, and I should say also throughout the night, that's important as well, because sometimes we start the night with certain conditions, and then we change those conditions in the middle of the night for our kids. And then we're surprised that they wake up and they need us to get back to sleep because we've changed the conditions that were present at the beginning. And so we need to have consistency at the beginning of the night and all throughout the night, the conditions need to stay the same. That's really important. Um, so one of the things that happens is that people unintentionally, our brains start to associate the bed with staying awake and being alert because we lay in the bed for hours awake and we can't fall asleep. And we don't realize that our brain is starting to create that connection. And so the way to break that, which seems kind of counterintuitive, is that you actually, if you've been in the bed or your kids have been in the bed for 20 to 30 minutes and they're still awake, then the key is to actually get out of bed because you're trying to break that association. They, they need to get out of the bed, stay nearby, don't do something stimulating, don't go into another room don't eat anything, don't turn on the lights, um, but stay near the bed and do something calm, relaxing, quiet. Sometimes even standing up near the bed um, is helpful, but just staying nearby until you start to feel sleepy or they start to feel sleepy and drowsy and then get back in the bed because we want them to associate the bed with feeling sleepy and drowsy, not with feeling awake. So sometimes you even have to go through that process a couple of times and on more than one night in order to retrain your brain, because that's what we're trying to do is retrain the brain and create a healthy sleep association. Um, and a really important thing is when you've set up these really good sleep associations and then and sometimes we unintentionally interfere with those then it can get everything off track. And I see that happening all the time too with families because we may add something to the conditions or remove something or change something about their sleep routine or their environment. And then we're off track again because we've broken those healthy sleep associations. So these are really, really important. And it's something to think through if you guys are struggling with, with your kids and their sleep patterns or for yourself, just really think through what, what are the conditions when they're falling asleep and during the night, what conditions are present? And are some of those maybe things that are not consistent and maybe that's part of the problem or are they things that you don't want to continue doing because they're not really healthy to do long-term? Um, and what are some things that might be more helpful that you could start doing? And this, like I said, it could be objects that are there that are present, like um, having a, for a child having a comfort object like a stuffed animal or a blanket, it could be certain noises. We'll talk about that in a minute, what types of noises might be helpful and soothing. Um, it could be an activity that you do every single night before bed as part of the bedtime routine, like some stretches or a massage, something soothing and calm. And it could be people because if your kids fall asleep with you sleeping right next to them and then you leave, then you're doing exactly what we're talking about here because you're creating a sleep association at the beginning of the night, but then you're changing that condition in the middle of the night. So then when they wake up again, they need you back there because they've already 
figured out, their brain has figured out that they can only fall asleep with you there. Um, so this is something to think through. So another big issue I mentioned earlier for people with ADHD brains is feeling overstimulated at night. And this happens partly because of that issue in the brain that I talked about, that front part of the brain that is understimulated. Um, what happens is it's not always understimulated. It's there's a problem with regulating that stimulation. So sometimes it might be overstimulated. That switch might be on a little bit too high. And then other times it might be switched off. And so our kids with ADHD tend to get overstimulated because they can't control that switch. And um, it really tends to happen under certain conditions. So for example, screens, we know that screens do, um, stimulate the brain. And that's extra important to know when you have a kid whose brain is already understimulated because anything that is stimulating to their brain is going to feel really good. And it, they're going to be drawn to that. And um, they're going to be, and because of the poor impulse control, it's going to become an even bigger issue. And that's a whole different presentation. But um, this is an issue. Screens are an issue for anyone before bedtime because it stimulates all of our brains, but it especially is powerful for the ADHD brain. So it's really important to turn off the screens an hour before bedtime. And it used to be the recommendation was 30 minutes, but through more research, they found it's actually taking about an hour for the brain to wind down after being on a screen. So they need to be turned off about an hour before bedtime. Um, another big thing is that the bed needs to be a no screen zone. And that's partially related to that issue I talked about with the sleep associations. We do not want the bed to be something that's associated with um, the stimulation of having a screen. So if you're on your phone in the bed, if you're laying in your bed and you're watching TV, if you're typing on your computer and sitting in your bed, then your brain is starting to associate your bed with high stimulation and we don't want that. And so the bed absolutely just needs to be a no screen zone. And I know this is challenging because probably a lot of people watching right now are doing that pretty regularly, having screens in the bed. And it's hard to break that habit and to make that change. But if you're struggling with sleep and if you want your kids to be on a really consistent sleep pattern, um, then this is a huge recommendation. I think most, um, really all physicians and pediatricians are going to recommend this. All the research shows this. So it's really important. Um, and then other things that stimulate the brain, we also need to keep away from bedtime. So we don't want to stimulate the brain right before bed. So caffeine is going to do that. We've actually found that alcohol does that as well and sugar, of course. So those are things to not do right before bed. Um, and even food can do it, but it depends. So if you're, if your child is hungry, then giving a very small snack just to tide them over so that they're not feeling hunger, that's keeping them awake. That might be helpful, but large snacks or big meals right before bed or getting up in the night and snacking. Those are all things that are no, no's because those are things that stimulate the brain. And those also are sleep associations that are a problem. Um, and so those are things to avoid. I highlighted daytime exercise. This is probably the most important thing you can do if you have an ADHD brain is to get some exercise during the day because it just has such a huge impact on sleep. It's so, so helpful uh, for the ADHD brain because the body ADHD bodies tend to be so restless and um, getting that daytime exercise can really wear out the body, wear out the brain and get kids ready for bed. It also helps with the circadian rhythm issue because by getting exercise during the daytime, you're sending the message to your brain that this is daytime and this is when I need to be awake. And when you're not getting exercise and there's very low activity at night, it sends the message to your brain that this is time to feel sleepy and tired and go to bed. So the activity at bedtime needs to be low. So I wouldn't recommend exercise right at bedtime. And there needs to be a gap in there. There can, you can do some stretching, some yoga, you know, things that are, are soothing to the body, but not um, high activity level that gets the heart going. Um, lighting can be stimulating. And I mentioned earlier that also affects the circadian rhythm. It also, again, is a sleep 
association problem. So lighting is important for many reasons, but it's, it's important to keep the lighting very dim or dark. Like I mentioned earlier, using just a nightlight. Some people really benefit from using sleep masks to really block out all the light. Um, the temperature of the room can help to, to lower your stim level of stimulation. Um, and so it, a lot of research has shown just lowering the temperature in the room or using a fan can be helpful. We do that with all of our kids. We always keep the fans on at night. It's also the sound can be soothing. Um, and then doing some relaxing activities to decrease that level of stimulation, like drinking warm milk, which they've found, you know, milk has tryptophan. And so that is something that actually promotes sleep and relaxation. So warm milk actually does in the research show that it improves sleep. Um, doing some light reading, taking a nice warm bath or shower, doing, like I said, some stretches, but not high activity massages and back and neck rubs. All of those things are very soothing to the body and, and the brain. And so they can really help you relax and get ready for bed. And, um, some of you may have tried weighted blankets. And part of the purpose of that for kids with ADHD is to help with that rest, that physical restlessness. Um, and it really, that, that light pressure for a lot of kids tends to be very soothing and it does not work with every child. So it's one of those things to experiment with and see if it helps. And if it does, you will notice, um, because I've had a lot of clients that just had instant progress when they started using the weighted blanket, both kids and adults. I've seen it with my, one of my kids, one of my three, it was magic. Um, she was, she's a kid that's always been very hyperactive, bouncing off the walls. She was out of her bed. As soon as I put her in it, she was out every single night. And one night I finally thought, I bet it's because her body is just feeling very restless. She just can't settle down. And so I thought, well, I'll try it. Everybody's been talking about weighted blankets. I tried it. And that night she did not get up. She went straight to sleep every night after that. She went straight to sleep. It was an absolute magic solution for her. And still to this day, years later, she has to have that weighted blanket every night and it, it works for her. Um, racing thoughts. I mentioned earlier, this is a really big issue for a lot of people with ADHD, just not being able to shut off their brain. So what we found is that having something to focus your brain on can be helpful rather than just telling them to, you know, try to clear their mind or just lay there until they fall asleep. That's really tough when your, your thoughts are just racing. Um, and so what helps is to shift your attention to something else. So an audio book that's not, um, not very stimulating. So something that's, you know, not high action, Podcasts, a lot of adults like to listen to podcasts, but again, podcasts that are kind of soothing, um, maybe kind of boring, uh, it can be helpful. And also it's helpful if they're familiar or they're very repetitive, even listening to the same things, um, because then your brain is, you're giving your brain something to focus on, but it's not something that's very stimulating and it's something, the voices actually can be pretty soothing. Um, a lot of people also benefit from using some relaxation or guided imagery tracks or CDs. So these help to walk you through some pro progressive muscle relaxation, how to go through your body and relax every muscle group as you go. Um, also walking you through some imagery, like relaxing scenes and places that um, we have actually found in the research by doing that, just imagining those relaxing places actually lowers the heart rate and muscle tension. Um, so these things can be helpful and it gives you something to listen to and to think about. Um, a lot of people like to do some light reading say for the same reason as the audiobooks. Um, now this is another one. So a lot, a lot of the kids and the teens that I work with, they put pressure on themselves to stop all the thoughts. And that pressure is not helpful because it kind of backfires. It actually kind of gets your brain more stimulated because you start to feel frustrated and angry at yourself and at your brain 
And so my son actually mentioned this to me when I asked him what he's done about those thoughts that keep coming, because you just are not going to be able to stop the thoughts. They're, they're going to be there. And so he said, what really worked for him is just letting those thoughts pass by, just kind of letting them be there, not pressuring himself to stop thinking. Um, but almost thinking of them as kind of clouds that are just passing by and not getting really into those thoughts, not letting yourself go down the path of, of, um, you know, getting excited about something and, and wanting to get up and talk about it, but just kind of letting them go, letting them pass by. And I think that was a great idea. And that's something we've actually worked with clients on in the past. And it's really been helpful. Um, but what does help with that is not just letting the thoughts pass by, but also having something else to listen to or to focus on the combination really helps. And so as far as noises go, these are just some suggestions. There's a lot of other ideas. I'm sure many of you have ideas that you could share, but these are some suggestions of things that do work. White noise helps drown out distractions. And um, it also, it has been shown to also lower heart rate and blood pressure. Um, and it serves a really helpful purpose for those sleep associations we talked about because they will start to associate that noise with falling asleep. So in the future, they will hear that noise and their brain will automatically start to get sleepy. And I did this from the time my kids were babies. I just had made a decision. They're all going to use sound machines, white noise machines. And I did it on purpose because I wanted them to form that association. And I wanted to be able to take that noise with me. So if we traveled, if we were in the car, I could turn on that noise and it, and it did, it made them sleepy right away because they were just so used to it. Um, but especially, um, the noise of water. So rain and ocean noises are really good and fan noises or using an actual fan. There's lots of really great apps um, to look into the Calm app. Another one that's not on here is Headspace. They have really um, great guided imagery and relaxation um, uh, scripts on there. And then they also have music, they have sounds. Um, so lots of good things. Relax Melodies is another good one. And then this CD, the ADHD Lullaby CD by Brian Wisda is really interesting. It's been recommended by lots of parents. Lots of parents swear by it. Um, he developed this based on research, of neurological research, as well as music therapy research. And so he came up with these, or he composed these tracks on this CD that um, basically follow what that next point says. They're kind of slow, repetitive, ambient sounds. And something about that music, it's kind of mesmerizing, but it does seem to really have a great impact on the ADHD brain. You know, it doesn't work with everyone. I've had a couple people try it and say, nope, that didn't work. But I can tell you that a lot of clients I've had have sworn by it. And so I decided to try it myself with my oldest when he was kind of going through a sleep regression period and, and having some insomnia and we tried it. And again, like, like with my daughter and the weighted blanket, this was a magic solution for him. The first night we tried it, he was asleep within a few minutes. And every night since then, he's the one now that he gets in the bed and he turns it on because he knows that that helps him. And it's become a new sleep association. Now he hears that music and his brain just instantly feels tired. Um, so that's something to think about and try lo-fi music in general is kind of that slow, repetitive music with ambient sounds. It can be very helpful. And then there's something called four, 432 Hertz music. So it's music that's um, right at that 432 Hertz um, level. Oops, sorry. And for some reason that music, it's just very soothing and it's very um, pleasant to the brain and it has been shown in the research to decrease the heart rate. So there's YouTube videos where you can find this type of music. Um, and so these are just all some helpful noises and sounds that can kind of distract those racing thoughts or help kids cope with them. 
Okay, let's see. Okay, and then this one is, I mentioned earlier that motivation issue is a big one just because going to bed is boring, getting into the bed is boring, um, laying there is so boring. And so it's just hard to get motivated to do it. And I like this quote because it says, motivation is what gets you started and the habit is what keeps you going. And that's exactly the philosophy that I've used for lots of families is first try to motivate them to do what we know is gonna help and then once they're doing that, then and they're doing it repetitively, then they're going to form this habit or these good sleep associations that are going to really work and keep their sleep on track. But first, we have to motivate them to do it. And so with kids, especially, that's a challenge. So we can do things like giving them some choices. So saying, okay, it's time to get ready for bed. I'll let you pick which book, which bedtime story we're going to read tonight, or which, which song do you want to play first? Um, those kinds of little choices just to get them going, get them motivated to start the process. And reward systems can actually be really useful with that bedtime process because it just gets them on track. It starts to develop that routine and then you don't have to keep using it. You know, once they've got it on track and these are habits, then get rid of the reward system. But just to get them on track, that can be a really helpful thing. Um, the next two are just little strategies that I've found can be really useful. Check-ins are used more as a reward, um, but this is a, just an example to give you with my daughter. She struggled like because she was so active and just always getting out of the bed. I was trying all these strategies to keep her in the bed. Nothing was working. Um, now later that weighted blanket did work, but earlier on, nothing was working. And what I finally realized one day is that she was trying to get my attention she, and it was just the stimulation of coming out of the room was just so much better than laying in the bed. So nothing I was doing was powerful enough to keep her there. So what I did all of a sudden, I realized I just need to let her know that if she stays, I will come and I'll check in. And I, I started very small. I said, if you stay here for two minutes, I'm going to come back and give you another hug and tuck you in again. So she stayed for two minutes and I came back and I gave her another kiss and hug and told her what a good job she did. And then I said, okay, now if you stay for five minutes, then I'm going to come back and give you another kiss and hug. And I've done this even as the kids have gotten older and these check-ins using them as rewards, it's really helpful with kids with ADHD because they have such a short attention span, you know, and they don't, they're not as impacted by long-term rewards, but short-term rewards are more powerful for them. So if they know that you're going to come back in just a couple minutes, then that might be enough to keep them there and getting that extra attention from you and praise from you is powerful. So then I, all, all you have to do is to start to extend those, you know, come, come in every 10 minutes. And honestly, once you get them to lay there long enough, they're asleep because they're tired. So the check-ins are really useful. Bedtime pass is for the kids who are getting out to go to the bathroom one last time or get one more drink of water or tell you one more thing. And so what you can do is create a bedtime pass, a card that, that says bedtime pass and tell them that you get one bedtime pass every night and one chance to come out of your room and you can use it to go to the bathroom, to get a drink of water, to tell me something, but you get one. And once you use that bedtime pass and you give it to me, then it's done for the night and you don't get any more. And what's amazing is that they, it gives them that sense of control that they know they're allowed to come out one time and they don't want to waste it. And so it's, it's really interesting how well that's worked for a lot of the kids that I've worked with. And I used it with my own kids and it worked very well to get them to stay. Um, and then a really big thing is we sometimes unintentionally reward or reinforce the wrong behaviors. So when they are coming out of their bed and they're running around and they're not listening, we give them tons of attention and we don't realize we're doing that, but we're, we're arguing with them. We're pleading with them. We're, um, we're lecturing them, we're laughing, all of these things are attention. And so, and we're reinforcing the behavior. So we have to really shift and only reinforce what's going well and try to not give attention to some of those other things and not reinforce those other behaviors. So think about what kinds of things you might be reinforcing at bedtime that might be contributing to that problem.
Um, and then for the teens and the adults that I've worked with, planning something enjoyable in the morning can make a big difference because if they know that, you know, getting to bed means getting to this other thing in the morning, that might push them a little bit further to get to bed earlier. Um, and that, that goes for us as adults too, making sure that we're planning something, something we can look forward to in the morning. It just makes it a little bit more motivating to get to bed. So last, this is my last slide. Um, for those who have tried these other strategies, um, tried everything and it's just really not working, um, nothing's working. There's always some treatments out there that can be helpful. And it's really important to talk to your doctor. So I don't want anyone to try these without talking to the doctor first, but these are some things to know about. So because we know that that melatonin production is happening a little bit later in the ADHD brain, having some melatonin as a short-term treatment, that's really important. It has to be short-term. It's not intended to be long-term. It's just intended to shift their circadian rhythm a little bit and get them back on track. Um, so that can be helpful. And it's intended to be used in a, as a really low dose um, because the ones on the, the ones that you can buy over the counter are typically already a, in a higher dose than what is needed. And really they just need a very, very low dose. Um, most doctors will tell you this too, and they only need it for the short term. So it's not something to start to rely on and use every single night, because again, that can actually kind of disrupt things even further at times. Um, so it's kind of a short-term treatment. And I, I wanted to mention a lot of people are using it right at bedtime. And so then there's still, that still is contributing to some problems because it's not going to really kick in quick enough. So they're still going to be laying in bed awake or struggling to get to sleep, um, even sometimes with the melatonin. And so it needs to be taken one to two hours before bedtime. So for us, for example, with my son, we when he's gone through some occasional periods of insomnia, this is one of the things that I use to get him back on track. We'll just do a couple of nights of melatonin. We'll practice some relaxation strategies and he gets back on track and we stop. And it's been very effective. Um, now we talked about the ADHD medications. It really depends for some going on a medication can actually help with sleep. Um, for others, if, if it is disrupting sleep, then it's something to talk to the doctor about because the timing of the medication can make a big difference, um, or the dose, whether it's short acting, long acting. So that's something to look into, um, for those with iron deficiency. So getting that testing to determine if that's an issue, iron supplements do tend to improve sleep. And magnesium is another interesting one. There's two forms, magne magnesium, magnesium glycinate and citrate both can improve sleep and they can improve restless leg syndrome um, based on the research. And so it has to be taken about 30 minutes before bedtime. Um, and again, it's something to talk to the doctor about first, but that can be helpful. The last one is not a medication. It's a type of therapy. So CBTI is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And it's a very structured type of therapy. It's based on research and it specifically addresses insomnia. It's more for teens and adults and it really is effective. So as you can see, it improves sleep in about 70 to 80% of patients. So that's another option that's out there. Um, so these are just some, some options. And like I said, you kind of have to find that magic formula that works for each of your kids or for yourself um, and pull from some of these strategies. Just in the last couple minutes, I wanna just give you a quick example of how to kind of pull these things together with one of my kids. So my oldest who has struggled the most with ADHD symptoms over the years, our, our magic formula that we have found, and he's a teenager now, is getting that exercise during the day and that outdoor time. He's in marching band and that's been really good for wearing his body out. He's always followed a strict bedtime routine and I've kept him on that routine even as a teenager. Um, he always does a warm shower before bed. His bed has only been used for sleep always. I don't have a TV in his bedroom. I don't even keep his computer in his bedroom. We keep it in an area of the house that's a common area and he wants to move it to his bedroom. And I have been very firm about it. I have not let him move it to his bedroom. 
and he is he knows he has to plug in his cell phone downstairs an hour before bedtime before he goes into his bedroom to start his bedtime routine. So his bedroom is a no screen zone and that has been really good for him. Um, we keep his room really dark with just a nightlight. He's got that ADHD lullaby CD that works like a charm for him. Um, and then when he occasionally gets off track with his sleep, like I said, we just do some relaxation strategies. We do a couple of nights of melatonin and then it gets him back on track. And I'm so grateful that these strategies have worked because as a parent, it's really, really good to be able to see your kids, you know, sleeping well, um, sleeping through the night, not struggling. And it, you know, it's really benefiting them. So that's all I have. Let me see this last screen. So this has my email address, our website, phone number, Feel free to contact me if you have questions, email me. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. And that's all. Also, um, I just wanted to mention, because I know, you know, we have a lot of families that ask from time to time about a recommendation for a psychiatrist, a psychologist, testing. So Missouri City Family Counseling can absolutely do that. They do accept United Healthcare Insurance private pay for other uh, insurers and they are accepting uh, new patients. So if you're looking or if you need one, and I guess what I would say from my advice um, as, as a parent is um, don't wait. If you don't have one, don't wait until there's crisis and you really need one because sometimes the waiting list can be long at um, some of these places. Yeah. So finding someone good that you trust that connects with your um, loved one is, is definitely really important. This is um, really, really good. And so many, you know, so many of our kids do struggle with this on so many levels. And um, just some of those, those tips, I think the question, the only question that we had in the chat box was just a reminder of what your son um, likes the best to fall asleep to. And was that that ADHD lullaby thing that you had mentioned? Yeah. And that's just what has worked for him. My daughter actually does really well with the nature sounds and some light music and her weighted blanket, um, you know, that's been part of her magic formula, but you really have to kind of try these strategies with each of them and see what works and what doesn't work. And then once you find it, be very consistent, stick with it every single night. And at, at times I probably am a pretty rigid parent when it comes to sleep, but it's because I know how important it is. And I've seen these things work when, when you are consistent. So I've just stuck with it and it's really worked for my kids. I think it's really important. And I know for sure from the teenage years that those screens in the room and the computers and the phones, um, the kids between all of the different social media and stuff like that, when they have their phones in the room, that really affects sleep. Some of them yes. stay up all night. <laughs> so many of them. And, and many of the clients on, I talk on the to social media. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a big deal. And so, yeah, yeah the, the phones downstairs or um, sometimes even in the parents' room because sometimes they get yeah. – um, they get sneaky later. Yes. So, you know, we've even had lock, lockdown phones we've seen yep. as well. One last thing, and, and then we're um, done for the evening, guys. Thanks for um, thanks for your patience. Um, <clears throat> the one last question that we have is, how long does it take to break a sleep association? Our nine-year-old has ASD, ADHD, has gotten used to falling asleep with us beside him, yeah. and is unable to fall back asleep when he wakes up at the night. So about how long do you think it takes to break the cycle? Give the pe people the patient's hat, Lindsay. <laughs> yeah, that I mean, that's a tough one, and many parents are in that same boat. And it honestly, it does depend on the child. It kind of depends on their, their level of flexibility versus rigidity. So with the ASD diagnosis, it may take a little bit longer um, because, you know, kids with ASD really do kind of need that routine. They like that routine. They push back against change. So it may take a little bit longer. It's hard to say exactly how long for any given child, um, but it's one of those things that you have to stick with it. It tends to get worse before it gets better because they're going to fight you on it. They're going to push back. You can also do it in a gradual way. You know, you can kind of gradually remove yourself as opposed to just you know, abruptly saying, I'm not going to lay with you anymore. Um, and I think that that tends to sometimes go over better and work better and use those other strategies to help like the reward system. Um, but I would also suggest potentially working with a therapist on that because 
it can be hard to do this on your own as a parent and it's, it can be emotionally draining and exhausting. And I think having that person that's working alongside you and keeping you on track can also be helpful. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, guys, um, again, um, for anybody that joined uh, later, uh, tonight's webinar has been recorded. Um, you are going to get an email with a copy of today's slides. So all of the little references of the things that she's used is going to be in there um, and, a, and a link to the recording. So thank you so much, Lindsay, for uh, joining us again. It's always a pleasure to have you um, speaking. You have such great, um, good ideas and tips, real tips, um, real stuff, not only in your practice, but with your own kids as well. So we appreciate that. Thanks thank so much, you. everyone. And I hope everybody has a great evening. Take care. Sure.